Hello, and welcome to Legal Management Talk, the official podcast of the Association of Legal Administrators. I'm your host, Justin Eskenazy. Welcome to uh, another annual conference edition of Legal Management Talk. And I'm joined today by uh, two presenters at conference. They both uh, come from Loeb Leadership. David Sarnoff is the Director of Strategic Partnerships there, and Joy Stevens is a senior consultant. And they will be presenting uh, on day two of annual conference in Seattle. That's Tuesday, May 9th. Their presentation is uh, performative versus authentic allyship. And that will be on 11, at 11.15 a.m. on day two. Uh, welcome, both of you. Great to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Likewise, Justin. Thank you so much. Of course. So I kind of want to start with that uh, term allyship and what and, and what it means to be an ally, because I feel like we hear so often people say, you know, I'm an ally for for, you know, for whatever community. But I don't know that everybody totally knows what that means. So can you kind of explain, you know, what what do they mean and what should they mean if those are two different things? Mm, very perceptive. So and I do like the way you phrase that. What do they mean and what should they mean? Um mm. An ally is someone that is willing to stand in the gap for you and potentially stand in the path for you. If you think about it, we, we've, we've heard the phrase, the word ally in historical terms when we talk about world conflicts, you know, the allied powers, of world war, et cetera. And even though that takes on a military meaning, what is happening there? You have groups of people that have decided we are going to move forward whatever forward looks like, we're going to move forward together. We're going to have each other's back and we would potentially be willing to take a bullet for each other. If you boil that down and put that in um, terms of business, of legal entities, of corporations, et cetera, we are moving towards the same progressive ends. We are interested in the, the growth career-wise and social-wise of each other. And I am willing to take a bullet for you. Now, the bullet and these terms looks different. It means I'm willing to stand in the way if someone is trying to uh, engage in like microaggressive behavior. I'm willing to make myself potentially a target, knowing that I'm doing so in order to draw attention away, um, refocus someone's energy or efforts, um, potentially even become another person that gets ridiculed because I'm trying to help you. That means putting myself in harm's way and some usually mentally instead of physically. Um, but that's what it takes to be a full, true ally. I'm willing to go go toe to toe for you and with you. Now, what it means more often than not in uh, to the average person is I am a friend to this or that marginalized community. You know, I hope for the best. I don't want to oppress them. I don't want to be part of the oppressive structure. Um, sometimes not doing what we could do to help them. And that's where, like David and my um, presentation gets into performative allyship. You can be a friend to a group versus authentic allyship. You will go toe to toe with that group. You see? Yeah, and and if I could just add to that because uh, you know Joy makes some really great points, uh, and for me it's a learning journey as well. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm currently the co-chair of the diversity. Inclusion Committee of the New York City Bar Association and have been active in, in the space for several years, but it's still an ongoing learning journey for me. And I remember being on a panel a few years ago, and I referred to myself as an ally. And uh, a woman of color pulled me aside afterwards. You know what, David? I could give you some feedback. Maybe you don't call yourself an ally, be recognized as an ally, because anybody can call themselves an ally. And to Joy's point about people say, oh, I'm an ally. But are you an ally in that conference room when someone says something offensive? Are you an ally when people aren't in the room and something is said offensive about them? And do you stand up? Do you call it out? Do you say this will not be tolerated in in this company or, or this firm. So yeah, I, I think to Joy's point, it's it's a matter of of what you do and not what you say. Right. Exactly. And and you know, obviously actions speak louder than words, as 
as it's Absolutely. always said. So I know that since, uh, especially since 2020 and the the death of George Floyd and the kind of reckoning that came about in the aftermath of that in terms of you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA, um, you know, I, I think we've seen a lot of firms kind of take steps to advance those initiatives, but, uh, you know, how, how much progress have they really made? And, you know, are they continuing to keep, to keep up that progress? It's a really good question. And I think mm -hmm. what we've seen across the board, all, all industries, all entities is, uh, fatigue when it comes to dealing with DEI, because it is extremely emotionally taxing. Uh, David and I will both tell you that the kind of work that we do when it comes to diversity and inclusion work, there's only so much of it that you can schedule in a week or a month's time because it is emotionally exhausting, um, even, even the introductory classes. And so for a company to commit to improving their diversity numbers or being better allies to different communities, I think there was a lot of enthusiasm and rightfully so after the death of George Floyd, there was this uh, energy input. We need to be different. We need to do something different. A lot of hiring of DEI specialists, et cetera, without really understanding that this was a lifestyle change and not just a fad diet, so to speak. You know, this is going to take some commitment and some energy over time. And we're seeing people similar to New Year's resolutions, when you decide you're going to go to the gym in January and then in April, nobody's in the gym anymore. That's what we're seeing right now is we realize this is a lot harder than we thought. And we don't know if we've got the commitment and other things get in the way. Life gets in the way. Uh, financial reports get in the way. Uh, hiring and business gets in the way of wanting to be better allies to different communities. Um, the prioritization has started to get lower and lower. Um, and because it is such a long journey to full inclusion, a lot of people like to see instantaneous results. And they've been working on a plan or something for two, maybe three years, and they haven't saved the world. And they don't know what else they need to do. And so people tend to give up. And I think that's what we're seeing now is a, a reckoning of this is a lot harder than we thought. And and I think that's what it comes down to, Joy. And you know what recognized when they did try to increase um, numbers of people of color and people from other underrepresented communities, that it's not about just going out and hiring people. It's about creating an inclusive culture that allows everyone to thrive and advance and build a career. And building an inclusive culture requires putting a lot of pieces in place before anyone should be hired. Right. Um, because what a lot of people find is that they – they go through the recruiting process, they accept the offer, and they start, and then they, they realize there is nobody in leadership who looks like me. Um, a lot of my colleagues don't have anywhere near my lived experience, um, and the resources and the support and the guidance and the path to leadership isn't as well paved as it should be, and then people decide to move on. And, and mm -hmm. I think that contributes to some of the fatigue Joy talks about in firm leadership. Um, but it's also really uncomfortable. And particularly in the legal profession, people aren't used to sharing their emotions, sharing how they feel, um, particularly attorneys. And when you get into substantive D and I work and, and creating inclusive cultures, we we always tell people straight out, it's going to get uncomfortable, but it has to in order for there to be growth and development. And I think communicating that up front, setting expectations is really important. There's no one and dones in this space that, that are going to be successful. It, it's got to be an ongoing learning journey. Right. There's no magic class or magic 90-minute workshop that is going to fix every problem. It can introduce the idea of what needs to happen going forward, but the commitment has to be on a person by person level within your organization. I think you both brought up a really good parallel points so, of uh, first, I mean, I think instant gratification is such is baked into our culture so much nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a slow process can be tough to get through. 
and also something that's uncomfortable, inherently uncomfortable, is hard to get through. So how do you, if you're um, you know, pushing DEIA initiatives, break through both of those barriers to continue making progress? It's an iterative process. You know, um, if you take a long look at history going back, let's just say, I won't even give you the whole boring 500, 400 years. Let's just do 70 years. If you go back to the 60s, where you had massive, you know, civil rights movements, you had marches on Washington, Martin Luther King was active during that time. Uh, one of the catalyzing events of the 60s was uh, everyone trying to cross the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, but another catalyzing event was the death of Emmett Till, where he had come down to the South from Chicago. Um, there were accusations made that were never, actually the woman that made the accusation has recanted in her old age, but you know, somebody lied on him, he got lynched and beaten beyond recognition, and his mother had an open casket funeral. Everybody saw the trauma of being Black in the United States. We have a similar, and it sparked a lot of action. We have had a similar moment here where everybody in almost real time witnessed the death of George Floyd um, at the hands of the police. It became incontrovertible evidence and people were spurred to action. What I think can happen now because of that need for instant gratification and that uh, sometimes that fatigue is recognizing if you do take that long look at history, recognizing we have another chance to build on this energy and make real change. Before it was the Civil Rights Act getting signed into law. Now we have a chance to um, reverse, eliminate, and create laws that benefit disenfranchised groups. There's a lot of anti-LGBTQ legislation going through the ranks right now. We need allies from a political standpoint, because a lot of times people say, I want to be an ally, but I don't want to get political. That's where the rubber meets the road. We need to make sure that laws are not being created to disenfranchise already marginalized groups. And we also need to make sure that laws are created that even the playing field for everybody else. This is our chance to iterate on that while we still have the energy left. And things may fall back. It's not a direct line, but we won't go back as far as we were before. And so the next iteration, which will probably come at a faster rate, maybe 2030, instead of, you know, 50 years later, we do something else again. And so we continually trudge forward. You know, there's a phrase that says, uh, I got to stay three steps ahead because they're going to push me two back. And so that's what we see happening in all the ENI spaces. You make some advances, things get contracted, but it's not as bad as it was. And then you start from there and you move on again and again. I told you it's exhausting. <laughs> now, and and just listening to you, Joy, it, it's a shame that it takes tragedy to, to spur people to action because there's so much research um, from McKinsey, The Great Place to Work, the Harvard Business Review, the business case for creating inclusive cultures that the most diverse teams tend to be the most innovative, the most productive, the most profitable. And the ROI is there mm -hmm. if people want to invest. And, and Justin, you talk about accessibility, you know, because that's a growing area right now um, combined with, with diversity, equity, inclusion. And there is the concept of universal design that where you make, workspaces and programs uh, accessible for as many people as possible with closed caption, with certain door handles that are accessible to everybody with minimal physical um, by motor skills. Uh, and, you know, and it's called universal design. And they say universal design is good design because it benefits everyone. And I think law firms uh, have a, a way to go to embrace that. Some are doing better than others, but just an example, um, you know, firms bring people together uh, in large part around happy hours and, and alcohol. Well, the research shows that uh, Gen Z doesn't do those kinds of events as much as 
people from older generations. So in order to be inclusive, do you have mocktails or do you create other opportunities for socialization that don't involve alcohol? Um, it's, you know, some people think it's, it's, you know, petty or, or inconvenient, but if you, you truly want to be inclusive and mm -hmm. it, right, coddling, um, but the organizations that do practice it have much more of an emotional anchor to their culture from their employees than mm -hmm. the firms that dismiss it. And, you know, I want to piggyback off something that you're that you're alluding to. Like I use the word coddling. I think that mm -hmm. we tend to think in extremes. Either you get yeah. thicker skin and suck it up and just take whatever is coming at you because that's what I had to go through. Or you're too soft. You need to grow up, blah, blah, blah. Um, and why should we be expected? I hear this phrase. Why should we be expected to bend over backwards for, quote unquote, these kids who need to X, Y, Z? And I think if each one of us was honest with ourselves and we examined what we would have wanted when we first started, regardless of what happened, what did we want? We want the same things that we see Gen Z being brave enough to ask for. And maybe, and I'm just, you know, potentially projecting, maybe there's a little bit of jealousy in there when we <laughs> see people who are 27, 24 saying, I want this. And we didn't even know 30 years ago that we could yeah. ask for that. And so I think yeah. that also adds to, from a generational standpoint, some of the misunderstandings, lack of communication, uh, uh, defensiveness, et cetera. And, and I think that direct communication, Joy, is where a lot of work needs to be done. And, and, and I coach a lot of partners and practice group leaders, and I hear all the time, why do I have to do it? Nobody did it for me. Mm -hmm. and, and I say, you're right. You're right. But do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Because mm -hmm. if you want to be effective, you're going to have to adapt and change because millennials are the largest population in the workforce. And granted, for the first time in the history of planet Earth, there's five generations in the workplace. Different preferences for feedback, technology, communication. And we have to talk to each other to understand where we're at being able to meet people where they're at. Uh, I was so in the 90s in a law firm. I worked sometimes till two in the morning and back at eight in the morning. That didn't get me a pat on the back. That was expected. But I didn't feel empowered to say, hey, can I have the next couple of days off because I've been working, you know, 25, 30 hours in three days. Right. A 60 to 80 hour work week should not be an expected standard anywhere in any industrialized nation mm -hmm. for any any opportunity. Uh, the one caveat I might say would be healthcare, where you tend to have doctors that are on call for like 36 hours. I get that. But even when they're on call, they do get days off afterwards. I think um, improving the work-life balance for uh, in law firms particularly could again, if you make it better for the 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 smallest group among you, you make it better for all. That goes back to your idea of you know yeah. having a better accessible design. You can design a work week too. You can design workload. Um, it could lead to expansion of a practice because if you're running everybody at a hundred percent, you can't grow because no one has time to pick up a new client. You run everybody at 80%, you got a lot more flexibility, creativity can come in. People have time to focus on things. And yeah, you might have a little bit more, uh, as we might say, overhead, but it gives you the ability to grow the way people want to grow. You can't keep pouring into a cup that's already full. So and, and, yeah, and but, spread it out. And, and just to kind of acknowledge the other side of it, you know, given the nature of the practice of law, if there is a trial, if there is an M&A closing, sometimes we have to work through the night. We have to work on weekends. Um, I think that needs to be communicated. But as long as it's not the every day, I think there could be more understanding and acceptance mm -hmm. that, look, it's not going to be every weekend, but there are times where because of the way mergers close, we're, we're going to have to work this weekend. Right. And I think if it becomes uh, an understanding of this isn't something that we expect all the time, 
then when you do have to work a weekend, they're okay. I knew this was coming. Maybe every other weekend, once a month, something, I get it. Mm -hmm. But if I'm working late every night, and then I'm also working every weekend, sometimes on things that are not immediate, burnout is real. And burnout happens even faster when you feel like the extra effort you're putting forward isn't being appreciated. So it all, there's a balance to be had that I think they need to look for. Right. I think um, uh, you brought up communication. I think that's obviously so key across so many aspects of, of the industry. Um, so what kind of ways of communicating have you found that are most effective, especially when you're trying to bridge the gaps, uh, you know, among the among the generations when, you know, one people in one generation are used to one thing and people in another are used to a different thing. So how do you effectively bridge that gap when you're trying to communicate these uh, these, you know, different expectations? But David, you, you want, want to start? Me I feel like I can yeah. it. No, no, that's okay. Um, for for me, Justin, it's about being direct, and, and I don't think there's enough of that um, in general, but particularly in the legal profession. Um, to our colleagues, uh, there there's a saying in coaching: clarity is kindness. Um, a lot of times we leave things ambiguous and left to interpretation, and that's where a lot of the problems start. And, and I'll give you an example. I was coaching a, a practice group leader at a large firm, and during one of our sessions, he came in, and he was a little agitated. I said, what's going on? He said, I emailed my associate a question. They texted me back an answer. If I wanted a text, I would have sent a text. If I send you an email, I expect an email. I said, did you communicate that to the associate? Why do I have to? Well, if you communicate that up front, here's my preferred method of communication. When I send an email, I expect an email. You avoid the conflict of receiving a text in response. And if you still receive a text, then you you have an opportunity to give feedback um, and have a, a learning moment, but I, I think um, it's very important to have direct communication to set expectations. And if we have mutually agreed upon expectations, now we have something to measure. Did we meet expectations? And I think far too often people will let things go that do bother them and it builds and it builds until it's a, a, a a broader conflict um, that can impact a working relationship. You know, um, I use an example that if we go to lunch and I have spinach in my teeth, until you tell me, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and I think what I'm doing is fine. Until somebody gets that feedback, that direction, um, they think everything they're doing is fine because nobody's told them they need to change it. Joy? I... Uh, agree with everything that you're saying there. And I think all that I can add is whenever you're trying to bridge the gap between specifically as we talk about uh, the uh, age generational differences, but this is also true for cultural differences, religious differences, mm -hmm. racial differences, gender, et cetera. When you're trying to bridge the gap between a difference, there has to be some foundational level of uh, open-mindedness, willing to willingness to understand and accept the other person as they are in both directions. If you can start with that, then you can build a strong relationship between any two people. If they know going in, we both want this to work. We both want uh, to understand each other. We're willing to listen to each other. Then you can have a really impactful conversation with, uh, I'm just going to pick on the two easiest groups, a boomer and a Gen Z can have a great relationship, mentoring up, mentoring down, um, learning from each other. If they both walk into that relationship, expecting to share, expecting to listen, expecting their expectations to be challenged, what have you. Um, it can't be one-sided where I'm the senior partner and you're going to do, do it the way I want to do it. They need to be willing to listen and learn. Same, similarly, the junior associate, the junior partner, whatever it might be, needs to be willing to have some patience with that power dynamic, but also be brave enough to speak up and say, this is what I'm looking for. 
any relationship needs to start with an understanding of this is who I am and this is what I'm looking for in this instance. You do that, you can have a great relationship um, and you can start to bridge those generational or cultural or racial divides. But you got to be able to listen to each other. All right. And and to to kind of bring it back to allyship and, you know, being able to uh you know work on yourselves in a way that um that positively affects others um you know I, when we when we talked before you used a really uh you used a really great analogy that I liked uh that you know everybody's for paper straws in that case it's you know environmental consciousness but the analogy holds true uh, until their own gets soggy and then they say take me back to plastic straws right. so um and so in that in that kind of vein you know, how do you know how do people look at themselves and you know really try to do the work to to mm -hmm. advance DEIA? Great question, and I do like that analogy. You know, um, we're all we're all for when it's easy to do, it's easy to do, and I'm all for it. I got my energy there, but when it starts to get uncomfortable, when my straw gets a little soggy, and uh, it doesn't feel the same. And I don't know that I'm not getting a little pulp as I drink. You know, my uh, biases tend, tend to come in. I make a conscious decision. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go back to a plastic straw. In the DE&I world, recognize that you are making a conscious decision to no longer be progressive. If it gets hard and it gets uncomfortable and you decide I'm not going to fund this uh, diversity council, we're not going to give any support or uh time allotment to ERGs or any sort of diversity event, et cetera, we're not going to support it. We're taking all the energy and the money out of it. Recognize that you're doing it. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Recognize the consequences that could potentially come along with it. Some people choose plastic straws. Recognize that you are not part of the progressive front, so to speak. Doesn't mean that you can't still do some things or still want to do the right thing, but your journey is going to be slower. And your results are going to be slower. And the people that are watching for those results are going to become less patient, meaning yeah. all of a sudden your uh, social status is falling. The, na you know, the name of this firm is being bandied about as not really progressive or there's no place for me there. What sort of restrictions is that going to put on the talent you can start to attract five, 10 years from now? All of that plays in together. So if you decide now you want a plastic straw, recognize that you're hurting yourself in the long run. Yeah, and, you know, to Joy's point, you know, whether or not it moves at a faster speed or a slower speed, I think one of the most critical components is where's your leadership? You know, are the managing partners out in front modeling the behavior they're expecting of others? Are, are they the ones communicating to the firm the priority of this initiative? Or are they pushing it down to directors and managers who aren't as empowered uh, as the leadership, the executive committee? And, you know, is that by design? Is that to maintain status quo? Um, and also, are you responding to the needs of your clients? Um, I hear this more and more. Clients are sending demographic surveys to firms saying, tell us what you look like. Um, how many people from these communities or identities do you have? And when firms realize, wow, we don't have a lot, what do we do? Um, you know, whether it's driven economically, altruistically, uh, morally, uh, or from a value standpoint, um, again, it, you know, in our experience, it tends to benefit everybody. Exactly. And before we wrap up, which I hate to do because there's there's so much more we can still talk about, but um, you know, I am curious what what can people expect to learn from your your presentation um, outside of of what we talked about today. You know, they, me, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they, they're certainly going to learn the distinction between performative and authentic allyship. And, and Joy and I have worked a lot together. Um, be prepared 
for an engaging, interactive workshop. If you just want to sit back and don't say anything, um, you know, that's fine. But we're hoping people are coming to participate, speak up, share their thoughts. We love it when people don't agree with us. Um, it challenges, you know, our values and, and practices and strategies. And we learn from our participants as much as they hopefully learn from us. So we, we're going to have a mix of, of knowledge there, dialogue, case studies, small groups, breakouts. It's, you know, hopefully afterwards people are going to feel like they had a little bit of an aerobics class. <laughs> exactly. It will be a uh, mental, emotional aerobics class, uh, a couple of roller coasters in there as well. And I think um, we are looking for people who leave that room to know what needs to be done. Now, it's going to be a personal decision if they want to do it, but they will know what needs to be done to be a real ally, to be recognized by any other marginalized group as an ally to that group. Here's what needs to happen. And um, that'll be very clear, leaving that room. Great. Well, I mean, I, I know I can't wait to to pop in and uh, meet you both in Seattle. And Great. um, and I hope that uh, everybody attending will... Uh, We'll certainly take a look at at being at your presentation. And again, that's uh, in the morning, eleven fifteen on day two of the conference. Yeah, it's uh, going to be right before lunch, so we're going to get your appetite worked up. You're exactly. Yeah. That's what you want. Yeah, right, well, absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks again, uh, Joy and David, for for being here. Uh, I know I certainly learned a lot, and uh, and you know I hope to uh, see you again real soon. Absolutely. See you in Seattle. Definitely. See you in Seattle. <laughs> right. Be well. Thanks again to our listeners and subscribers for tuning in. If you want to see more, be sure to check out our YouTube page or download the podcast anywhere that you get your podcasts. And of course, you can learn more about ALA at alanet.org. Until next time.